All right, Hillary, welcome to the Preacher Boys podcast. So good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to chat with you. And like I said, uh, your book, it probably every page is hyper relevant to my audience. Um, and we can't go through the whole book. So if you're listening, pick up a copy of The Wisdom <laughs> of Your Body. I'll do a quick plug there. Um, head to the show notes, just grab a copy, at least add it to your cart so you remember to do it later. Uh, but yeah, I mean, first and foremost, um, let's just go back to kind of the beginning of starting to put this book together. Like, sure. what was it for you that brought this topic to the forefront of your mind? Yeah. So if if I'm to just hit the nail on the head here, embodiment would be one of the currents that runs through the book. What does it mean to be a body, not just have a body? Right. And that really is something that comes from my own lived experience of really waking up to realize that I had been trying to disconnect from my body in a myriad of ways and that that was hurting me. And that was, Mm -hmm. that was not sustainable for my life, but also was deeply connected to stories around which bodies are valuable, how we uh, accrue social power, uh, and what it meant to belong in the circles that I was in. So really coming home to my own body. And then of course, like this, I keep, saying this to my friends. And I think they probably say it to me too. Like everyone was laughing about this before I ever knew it was a joke that I was researching embodiment from an extremely cerebral academic intellectual perspective, which is really kind of like, it's, it's funny. I was trying to think about being a body and and I don't want to like shame myself for it, but I do think it's funny. Like I was trying to get as close as I could to being a body, but I was still thinking about it, still trying to understand it and research it from kind of a, a, yeah, a cognitive perspective. And so really, I think moving it down into my tissue, all the things that I knew and had learned through all of my years of graduate study came, I would say probably at the end of, of mm. so many years of studying it intellectually. And, and it made me think about how important it is for us to, to learn different stories about our bodies so that we can come home to ourselves, so we can come back into our bodies, given the millions of ways that we're invited to leave constantly. Yeah, I, I think it's important to really define terms because that's something yep. that your book does really well. And when you talk about the difference between having a body and uh, and being like you yeah. are your body, uh, I mm-hmm. think on some level, we probably have some idea of what that means. But can mm-hmm. you kind of just define a 10,000 foot view what the distinction is between those two approaches? Yeah. So I think that the distinction, I mean, again, here I'll use the word embodiment is the experience of being a body instead of thinking about ourselves and our identity primarily as our thoughts or our minds, or even other people's thoughts about us or other people's thoughts about our bodies, Mm -hmm. the ability to experience ourselves in flesh is, is what I'm talking about here. Um, the ability to tune into the sensation in our body, the ability to trust that to continually come back to our bodies as the place where life happens, the place where we exist instead of, I think the narrative that's handed to us and maybe even the way that we survive pain, trauma, um, faith context, whatever it may be is you are, you are your spirit and your Mm -hmm. spirit has a body or you are your mind and your mind has a body. And therefore the body is this kind of devalued subjugated thing. It's an object And I'm trying to return kind of the subjectivity to the body. So your body is, is alive. Your body is you. Yeah. You you speak to in the book, the idea like, you know, people saying, oh, I can't get my body to do this, or I wish Uh my body would do this as opposed to just leaning into what your body's telling you. And Uh that's such a different approach. And, um, you know, I mentioned the book on the podcast before, but that was a shocker to me when I was reading when the body keeps the score, which I mean, everybody I've talked to who works in these fields mentions that Mm -hmm. book in one way or another. And, you know, it was just how much information your body's telling you and how you use the term wise, like how wise your body is and Mm -hmm. what it can teach you. And I am curious, like specifically focusing in on kind of Christian circles, Mm because there's a, there's a lot of toxic teaching in a lot of Christian circles Mm -hmm. around the body. In fact, you dedicated your book to people who, uh, were told, shown, or made to believe your body's anything other than sacred and wise. Um, why do you think that so many Christian circles have such harmful teaching around the body? Mm-hmm. Well, 
Okay, there's a few different angles I could take on this. I think you could almost write a book about this. I, I, mean, I mean, almost, <laughs> right? Yeah, you just teed me up so well here. I'll I'll hit a few different angles. I think one is historical that we have inherited in in some Christian circles, not all, but in some, a Platonic worldview, a dualistic worldview, or even what we could call it a Gnostic worldview, where there is this separation between mind and body, spirit and body. Plato was one of the first to say, Mm. we are, we are just different from our bodies that we are more, our minds, our minds are closer to the spirit. Our minds are better able to escape the, the traps of Mm. being, being in flesh, being physical. And so we have this worldview that we've inherited. And most of us don't really know that that's what's impacted the way that we read and interpret scripture. So we have just kind of insidiously in the fabric of our society, these stories that the body is bad, that shape everything from, I think the way that we uh, talk about our bodies, the way that we care about what we look like all the way to how we understand medicine and how we understand Mm. stress and the way that we kind of relate to other people when they're in distress. So I think it touches every, every corner of our society and it's impacted by these worldviews that we've inherited. And then I think that there's a kind of another piece of that, which is about kind of how power and oppression are worked out related to bodies. One of the things that I I try to get really clear about in the book is that all of the isms that I'm aware of, all of the different ways that we slice and confer power in our society have to do with the body, which bodies have the most power, which bodies are seen as valuable, which Mm. ones are seen as good and the ideal and anything that is able to Um, any time a person is able to identify with their body in one way or the other says something about how they fit into that hierarchy of bodies. And so we have, I think, yeah, we have, we have stories around oppression and power that are also impacting what we have going on in the church, whether we like to believe it or not. And then I would say that I think it's been a survival strategy for so many of us to like eject out of the body. If we think that the body is a problem, if we think that the body is where our suffering is and something better is coming on the other side, like life really begins when your body dies, Mm. then that's a lot of incentive to say, I'm not going to put a lot of energy or effort into being compassionate or loving or getting to know we're trusting this because so many of us have used or experienced scripture weaponized against us to say, your body is actually antithetical to the spirit and what God is doing here. Your body is sinful. Mm. So we hear, we hear things that I think are actually, if I'm, if I'm just kind of naming my assumptions, I think that those are misunderstandings of often the, the writings of Paul, but those stories of ejecting out of the body are survival strategies too. Cause sometimes pain is in the body. Mm-hmm. Death is in the body. Suffering's in the body. And And it is much easier for us to imagine that everything that's real is somewhere else when being here is very, very painful. Right. Well, I mean, there's so much of Christian theology. And again, I I, I don't need to say this every time, but of course not all, but so much of Christian theology and, and church vocabulary is focused around that you know, temporal nature of your, you know, your, mm-hmm. your body is going to be, you know, it's going to be gone soon. How many times you hear people saying, you know, I'm limping now, I'm going to be running, you know, on streets of right. gold soon, or, uh, you know, even when you get to conversations about, you know, environmental issues or things like that, you get into this topic of, you know, this world's not my home, I'm just passing through, you hear statements like that. Mm-hmm. And it gives you this freedom to not focus on the now and all the things that you're supposed to, like, scripturally, steward the things that you've uh-huh. been given to take care of and, and and care for instead our language is always looking forward mm-hmm. it's it's and it's really funny i heard i forget where i heard it but there was a someone was preaching on the passage where they're looking up when christ ascends you know mm-hmm. into heaven and the angels come and they're basically you know this is not the king james version but they basically say why are you looking up in the sky like there's work to do and mm-hmm. i think a lot of christians have that perspective of looking up going like something better is coming, something mm-hmm. better is coming that they neglect and make their time honestly worse here <laughs> in the yes. present time. Right. Well, you're saying something I think, which is really at the heart of the book, the body is always in the present. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are ways we could say, yeah, our, 
our memories of trauma are sometimes in the past and are trying to protect us in the future, but our senses, our ability to connect with the environment around us through our, through our body is, is here. It's Mm. always right here. And if here is not a place we want to be, if here's really hard, or we've been told here is bad, then it makes a lot of sense that we would leave our bodies or think that our bodies were bad and connected to our suffering. But I just, I want to name in here, if this, if you're listening to this and you are thinking that this sounds a lot like your inner dialogue or Mm -hmm. actually a survival strategy you've used, I think that there's so much compassion that we get to have for this. Like life is hard and Mm -hmm. the body, as much as it is the place where we experience joy and pleasure and vitality and connection, the body is also the place where we experience suffering and pain and death and aloneness and judgment Mm. and oppression. And if we are doing our very best to survive, like it would make sense that we would try to get away from those things. Right. And so I don't know if we need to necessarily beat ourselves up for escaping the body. If that's only been the two only survival tool we've ever been given or the way that we've had to belong in our faith context, but maybe there's something more for us, or maybe it, again, this is, I'm saying this kind of cheat tongue in cheek, like maybe it's important to consider a body that we're in. And maybe this has something to do with what God is doing here or what right. spirit is doing here or what justice looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I am curious. You brought up trauma and mm-hmm. that's, I, I think for my audience, so much of the book's helpful, but I think the section on trauma is going to be equal parts, like really challenging, like you mentioned in your book, and it's going to be really helpful. And I, I want to talk about that because a lot of times it is a coping mechanism to, you know, our body shuts down, you know, sometimes even not even consciously realizing it, you know, our body shuts down in the face of trauma. We, we disassociate from, you know, where we're at, that sort of thing. And in the last two years, and again, I'm bringing you on as an expert to, to talk through this, you know, in the last two years, what I've seen is there's, there seems to be two extremes that happen in the face okay. of trauma. You have people that, that are going, oh, get over it. I'm going to pull myself up my my bootstraps and not address it Uh and just power, you know, power forward. And then you have others that just soak in trauma and Mm -hmm. they just sit and dwell in it. And, and both are very toxic and harmful. And you can see the, the impact of both of those choices. Um, You know, there's gotta be something in the middle. Like there has Mm -hmm. to be some kind of middle approach that is healthy. And what does that kind of look like? What does healthily engaging trauma really look like? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So if I can just address the soak in it and the get over it kind of mentalities for a second, because I want to, I want to name, they are doing something, Hmm. they serve functions, but kind of like distortions, um, in a mirror, they don't really reflect what we actually need or what's actually going to help us heal. So usually we soak in it because we don't believe that it's over or Hmm. because we're trying to get our needs met so that it can be over. And we're not necessarily able to take in the new evidence that tells us it really is over. So staying in something um, in a way can be a way that we dysfunctionally protect ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. If I am staying, if I'm soaking in this trauma and I'm stuck in it and it is kind of, it's how I'm looping around, there is something that I'm doing there that is likely protecting me from taking more risks, um, from exposing myself to new circumstances where, yeah, where I could be hurt again or wounded further. Or maybe it is this kind of, again, um, truncated need that's not completing around feeling heard or feeling Mm -hmm. understood or needing to be believed in something. So in therapy, we call this cycling. When someone keeps coming back to something, it's because their nervous system is saying it's not over yet. And when we look at those people, what we often say is like, why won't you get over it? And we kind of do the opposite thing. We'll pull up your bootstraps to try to like knee jerk them out of it. But the reality is that we need to go into it with them and help accompany them out. Because usually if somebody is stuck soaking in it, their nervous system is not taking in the evidence that it's over Yeah, and they're not getting the care they need. I Mm -hmm. mean, that's a powerful thing that you hit on in the book is that there are things where just suddenly something triggers a memory or you, you... Again, it's not a conscious decision to soak in it. I think that's where, again, both sides look at the other, I think, and go like, how are you doing that? You know, people that look at the people that plow (laughs) through it are going like, 
how do you just not address this? You need to talk yeah. about this, have long conversations about this. Uh-huh. And then the people that are just pushing through it are looking back and going like, why are you just, you know, pick yourself up. Like, don't stay in this. Right. That's not healthy for you. And the reality right, exactly. is there's some healthy elements to both. <laughs> you know, like I said, yeah, there's some yeah. there's some middle ground there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but that was something that was, uh, again, you mentioned in your book, um, I believe it was yourself that gave the example of the, the car accident. You know, yeah, you mentioned, right. um, so you mentioned you were just in a totally foreign situation to that and then having a quick flash and mm-hmm. kind of panic mm-hmm. attack in, in relation to that. Um, right. And when the body keeps the score gives that example of, you know, if you're, sexually assaulted by a man in a trench coat, you know, or a man in a suit, and you're walking down a sidewalk next to some other man in a suit, it could set off that same rotation. You can't control your body's response to it, because uh-huh. your body is just trying to protect you. Exactly. It's, it's, yeah, it's a it's a really, again, it's your body telling you something. And like you said, I love how you said dysfunctionally protecting you. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it that warning system has been violated and broken. So it's yes. kind of setting off on its own. Right. Exactly. Oh, so then that can be really scary, right? When our body is constantly remembering the things that we don't mm. necessarily want our body to remember because we're trying to like go to work meeting or walk right. down the street or get our groceries or meet someone new. Like this can be an ex- extremely threatening, uh, scary experience and nobody necessarily understands, but all of a sudden we might feel like our body is on fire or we're panicking. Mm. So when you take the other example, the get over it example, I think about that is dysfunctionally protective too. It's a kind of like, I'm going to put a lid on this reaction to distance myself from both the trauma and from the reaction, because both of those are really scary and make me feel out of control. And so often when we have, um, And this is kind of like a little giveaway that I hope someone might be able to take to therapy. For those of you who are listening to the podcast, you go to therapy. When we feel the need to get over it quickly or shut things down, or we feel ourselves say to other people, you need to get over it. You need to shut things down. It's usually because we're replicating internally or externally a pattern of coping that was handed down to us. Mm. So if we were told early on, when you feel pain, lock it down move on, that feels like probably one of the only options that's available to us. And maybe even something we were rewarded for. Sometimes we even, here's some big air quotes, call it resilience. Like we say, look at how well you're thriving in the face of what you've been through. And I don't want to knock anybody who actually experiences what feels like an authentic congruent resilience. But if what's happening is we are shoving things down and then we're getting praised for it, not only are we doing the thing that we were only ever able to do, but it seems like it's working and probably actually making us feel better about ourselves too. Like we have some sort of superiority. So to answer your first question, what's healthy, I think I come back to a phrase that I often um, say to my patients that I often say to myself when I'm re-experiencing traumatic flashbacks or um, in a moment that feels otherwise overwhelming and connected to something really awful and big is it really did happen and it's really over. So validating it, right? That's the opposite of the get over it sort of thing. It's like, let's move towards it a little bit. And then the and it's over, which is the opposite of the soak in it sort of thing, where we're saying what around me, what in my context, what in my body right now tells me that I'm actually not back there anymore. And the ability to honor what happened and to be connected to the present, especially if the present is safe, is, is how we heal. Yeah, it, it's so contrary to the typical response that a lot of people receive, which is it wasn't that big a deal. Mm-hmm. Move forward instead of saying it was a big deal, but it's over. You know, mm-hmm. like that is such a cool way of approaching it. Um, and yeah. I, I, I'm kind of curious. There's another angle of this that happens too. And you, you mentioned cycling, and I, I don't know if this plays into this at all, but I know a lot of times people find themselves in the putting speak to relationship trauma or things like that, they'll find themselves in a cycle of going from one relationship to another that looks the same. And they keep creating, you know, again, subconsciously like new trauma. There's new things that are, and not creating in the sense that they're making something up, but creating situations in which something happens again, they're re-traumatized again. Um, You know, I'll give myself as an example, you know, I, I spoke with a trauma therapist who's been on the show and I said, I keep, I keep putting, uh, like older male figures in kind of father roles and then keep getting hurt in those relationships. And she's like, you're just trying to 
finish that your brain's trying to finish that connection. You want mm-hmm. the good version of that. So you keep pursuing this over and over and over again. Um, you know, how do we avoid, because again, there's a lot subconsciously happening. How do we avoid putting ourselves back into situations where we truly are in danger? Like, how do you, how do you distinguish between a real danger sign and listening to that and also saying like, okay, this is my body saying, you know, Hey, watch out, but there's really mm-hmm. not a danger there. Oh, that's such a good, such a good question. And I'm not sure if we ever really know how to do that perfectly. I think that even the question, oh, good. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, there like, you oh, go. We can all no. take an exhale. <laughs> like that there is something in us that I think as a, as a survival oriented being wants to prevent any hurt, wants to prevent any risk or any access to danger. And I'm not necessarily sure that we can do that, but what we can do is we can learn to get better at noticing those patterns better at finding the exit routes, better at maybe relying on people around us to help us see the areas in our life that we kind of are um, unaware of. But then I think probably the biggest thing is we learn how to help ourselves heal and we learn how to hold ourselves better Mm. when those things happen. So an example of this that I think is, um, it just feels very poignant for me. I have loads and loads of car accident trauma. When I sit in the car, my heart races Mm -hmm. and I have done a load of trauma therapy to the point where I can drive. I feel like I can drive comfortably. And yet I notice myself like activated when I get in the car. Is it fair to me to say to myself, I promise you, honey, nothing is going to happen. No, (laughs) because driving is one of the most dangerous things we do. There are risks in driving every time we get into the, into the car. Mm -hmm. And so I cannot promise myself that I won't be in danger anymore. But what I can say to myself is you're sitting in the driveway, the car is not on, there's no one around. And so this heart rate is probably your body warming up to say, Hey, keep your eyes on the road, pay attention. And this reminds you of something that was scary before. And what I can say to myself is, and I know that no matter what happens, I'm going to love myself through it. And I have a community of people who are going to believe me and who are going to help me heal. And mm. that is usually the thing that helps me get out of the driveway. If I feel like I'm really anxious and feeling really scared is not, you will be perfectly safe because that's not true, but you will survive and you will be able to heal and your body will do its very best to keep you alive. That thing that's, I know for sure. Right. Does this apply to almost any context? Because I know some, uh, you know, some have mentioned stepping into a church, feeling mm-hmm. that, you know, or um, I had one guest on who drove past a sign where the, the, the street name was the last name of, of the person who had abused them. Like it was uh-huh. a simple, quick thing because they were driving back into that town. They saw a street sign that had the same name. It just, mm-hmm. they triggered that. It, is it something where... You know, in almost any circumstance, you could use that same kind of technique with yourself to kind of talk through it. I think so. And what do we, again, this distinguishing piece here is, am I in danger right now or am I remembering danger? Mm. Is this telling me that there is something I need to be on high alert for in the present or something that's reminding me and my body is gearing me up to say, just in case. And we call that the false positive response. That is our body saying, Hey, this is pretty close to the thing that hurts you, or it reminds you of it. And so instead of you being blindsided by this, I'm going to give you all the energy that you need just in case to make sure that you could get out of here or protect yourself if you needed. So having that information then allows us when we have those triggers happen in our body to say, instead of what's wrong with me, or it's happening again to say, wow, body, you're so good. Look at how you're trying to keep me safe. No wonder that thing that we went through was awful. In fact, we thought we would never survive. So thank you. Thank you for giving me all of this energy to help me move through this or help to me, help me move away from what feels scary. And if we know this for sure, here's the caveat. If we really are safe, we say, and I'm safe right now. And that happened a long time ago and it was awful and we're here and it's over and I got you. Hmm. No. Yeah. It's, it's such a, like I said, it's just so different than the approach of just ignoring. And like you said, not treating your body like this other, <laughs> you know, right. like, yeah. cause I think a lot of times like you'll get frustrated and be like, why? Um, I, 
and I'll just keep using myself as an example because I don't want to start calling out people I've had conversations with, you sure. know, but, but, you know, that was a, there was a period on the show, you know, I've talked about this on the show before, you know, there was a period where it was taking a toll and having conversations about trauma, you know, having conversations about trauma every day. Uh, mm-hmm. it, if you're not careful, that it builds up and, and starts affecting you. And I was waking up in the morning with my heart racing. Like I just wow. felt I was scared to look at my phone. I didn't want to, like I was, I would wake up and then I would literally, when I would turn off my alarm, like I wouldn't look at my screen because I had to take a second because I knew there'd be messages mm-hmm. there. And, you know, for me, I was just frustrated with my body for that whole period of time. It was probably about a month and a half of just that. And, wow. you know, but recognizing like the energy your body's creating is for your good. Like it's trying to give you that adrenaline boost to, you know, caveman days, you know, got to escape the the saber tooth tiger waiting right. around the, the next bush. Um, right. So it is just such a different perspective and that's not a question, but it's just something that's refreshing to me kind of hearing you talk through it mm-hmm. is because I know like, again, that's on a smaller end of the spectrum. I can imagine people listening who've experienced severe sexual trauma, physical trauma, mm-hmm. child abuse, things like that. Um, they're probably feeling that tenfold, you know, and probably mm-hmm. are feeling that same frustration, you know, with, with themselves. You're right. And I think that when there has been just so much trauma, such significant threats, so much overwhelm, and then the compounding, what is often aloneness and judgment from others and shame and all of the things that go along with what it's like to have these experiences in our social context or in our relationships or in our development, what it does is it our eclips- eclipses our brain's ability to detect when we really are safe. Yeah. And so we know for people who've had experiences of trauma, particularly profound experiences during development, we're more likely to read a neutral stimuli as threatening. And so, right. Or in some cases, and here's kind of the flip side, more likely to become accustomed to and kind of habituated to distress in such a way that we don't actually notice that things are dangerous. So it can kind of go both ways. So the ability to pick out, okay, what actually feels good in my body is a reminder that our bodies are not just trauma storage machines, that yes, the body keeps the score, but the body also is the seat of so much of our goodness and pleasure and wisdom and joy. Like we are not just bags of trauma walking around. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like it, we have to intentionally look for what is enjoyable about being us and train our nervous system to recalibrate to what is happening in the right here. Right. Right. You, you mentioned the social context. And so like, it's one thing to be feeling this, but there's also people listening to this and who would be reading your book who know someone who's been through severe trauma and they're trying to walk them through that. You know, I, I'm one of those people I'm sitting down typically with survivors of abuse or trauma and communicating with them. And a lot of times, you know, trying to figure out how do you help somebody navigate this? Who's feeling like this? How do you, how do you talk someone down in situations where it is safe? How do you validate someone? Like as someone who's a a bystander to someone's trauma, how can you help them through this process and and be a good, a good ally in, in kind of learning to, to handle stress and trauma? Yes. As a psychologist, I feel like it's really important to make a plug here to say, one of the best things that we can do is recognize where our competence ends hmm. as as friends and caregivers yeah. and to recognize the difference between accompanying someone on their journey and actually trying to do what would be the work of processing with somebody who has the skills to build a container, to regulate someone, to help them get through profound experiences of dysregulation or dissociation or whatnot. So sometimes what we do is we say, can I help you find a therapist? Can I take you to therapy? Can I walk with you after your appointment? Can I help you pay for it? Because I know that you can't pay for it, right? Mm. Any of the things that actually direct people to the resources that are going to help them heal means that we can probably do more of the sustainable work of long-term friendship instead of burning out or having vicarious trauma. So that. That's kind of my front end plug as as a trauma therapist and specialist yeah. to to help people maintain friendships that don't all of a sudden become eclipsed by trauma support. But I think trusting people to know what they need. Um, so asking people what is helpful for you instead of deciding is really mm-hmm. important. 
right? Yeah. Letting people self-determine, especially because trauma removes our agency. And when we can have experiences where our agency is recovered, it is an element of our healing. So our ability to say in our relationship, you don't have to belong conditionally here or you get a voice is actually part of how we heal. So mm. making room for um, emotions is really important. Making room for the way that our body speaks up about things and honoring the messages that the body is giving. And I think it's really important just to have some, some grounding and regulation skills in our back pocket, right? If we, I'm sure, are you familiar with 54321? You've heard of this before? No. So 54321, right? What I was saying before is that our body is always here. Our senses are linking us to the present. And so when we're having a flashback or we feel triggered, what's going on is that our nervous system is responding as if we're in what was stressful in the past. So we can use our body to weave a thread of connection to the present in such a way that it helps ground us and get back into the present moment to realize, oh, we really are safe. So one way of doing that is by noticing five things that we see, four things that we hear, uh, three things that we're touching, two things that we smell, and one thing that we taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. And sounds familiar or, or like it would yeah, make I, sense? I, I believe, I'm trying to remember, I believe I read a book where it was yeah. referenced, but I, yeah, I'm glad you went through it because I would not yeah. have been able to uh, <laughs> to pull that <laughs> right. one out. And the, the really cool thing that most people don't know about this is that it's actually really important to, to language what we're, what we're listing off. So actually say out loud the five things that you see, even if you're alone. And the reason is that we get something called decreased regional cerebral blood flow. When we're dysregulated, we get blood flowing away from the parts of our brain that are responsible for um, kind of cognition, uh, perspective taking, uh, time awareness, really what we might even consider like a, a present moment reality. And so blood flows away from those parts of our brain to really resource the parts of our brain that are responsible for threat detection and mm -hmm fear response and danger awareness. And when we are using language and lists and um, kind of sequencing in that way, what it does is it forces blood flow back to the parts of our brain that are responsible for helping us know in an intellectual way that we are here as much mm -hmm. as it's through our senses. Yeah, that's, well, can you list those five just one more time in case someone's listening or driving and they're trying to yeah. think through these? Yeah, sure. And really, like, there is no magic formula. If it's five things you see, four things you see, three things you see, because that's all you can remember, that's fine. The but point what is you trying try to, to think and focus in on something uh -huh, other on than your senses. That. Right. Yeah. So usually we'll say five things you see, um, four things that you hear, or three things that you hear, uh, what you're touching, what you smell, what you taste. Kind of gotcha. in that order. Gotcha. Is is that change in blood flow the reason why in a traumatic situation it feels like time slowing down, or it feels like your you know your memory gets foggy when you try to recount what happened? Like, is that kind of why? Because your your brain's not thinking in the way that it normally is processing that information. Right. Yeah. Right. I think closer, a little bit closer to what you said at the end there. We actually store memory memory differently when we're experiencing a trauma. So it gets encoded differently. And what that can mean is that it's kind of disorganized and not linear in the, in the way that we normally time sequence things. Mm -hmm. So we're more likely to experience memory that is sensory or emotional or implicit kind of felt senses than we are what we might call declarative or discrete memory things like your grocery list or remembering an autobiographical memory that has a particular sequence to it. Like first I went to the store and then I got the tomatoes and then I put them in the bag. So when we have trauma, because memory storage changes, sometimes those events actually get reorganized or we don't store them at all. We just store sensory memory and not, not the autobiographical piece. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, yeah, that's helpful. Cause I know that's something that happens, but it's, I'm always curious, like the whys obviously of why certain yeah. things take place. And that's something like, it's very common, you know, talking with people who are sharing their stories. They'll be like, I don't remember if it was an hour. I don't remember if it was 20 uh -huh. minutes. I don't remember, you know, and obviously this is one of the reasons that reporting sometimes for assault doesn't happen yes. is because they, they, 
don't have any information to give. They didn't exactly. res- retain any of that. They remember being scared or they remember feeling a certain way, but they couldn't tell you what color shirt the person's wearing or all those sorts of right. things that we'd expect as someone who's a bystander is saying, why wouldn't you remember that? I would remember that if this happened, but yes. you wouldn't. Your, your brain doesn't work that way. Right. Your brain no. is so much more focused on surviving and sometimes surviving means dissociating. It means not storing data because it is way too overwhelming. So here's a really important, I think, um, point in the conversation to name that we exist in a community, in a culture, in a legal context that does not understand trauma, that does not support trauma survivors, and is extremely, I would say, um, not only uninformed, but harmful. Yeah. Because... We have people who are trying to get justice about their lived experiences of trauma, and the system is set up to demand that you can re- report your traumas in a way, one that is kind of cool and casual and doesn't bother you and is coherent and consistent. And that doesn't always happen. In no. fact, most of the time it doesn't. Within 24 hours, you know, like to make right. choices that, you know, you've never thought about in your entire life. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, you may not know the answer to this because this branch just like I would say, you know, I'm not a therapist. Uh, you know, you might go into this saying I'm not a legal expert, but I'm kind of curious if you have any thoughts as to how the legal system could improve, you know, the way that we look at these kind of situations, the way we do address, mm-hmm. you know, victims of trauma because it's a it's a thing that does come up, you know, pe- yeah. there's the issue of people not being able to report to their 40 when something happened at 16 just because right. of the the mental place they have to get to. And it's uh-huh. it's understandable in a black and white way why that makes it difficult when it comes to trying to charge these cases and trying to find evidence for these cases. But I do feel like there needs to be more education on how trauma works. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's both sides of that. So, um, I mean, what what do you see when you look at these kind of things? Like, what would you hope people would try to yeah. learn or get educated on? Well, I hear. I'll, I'll answer anecdotally first. In my practice, for people who've lived and experienced trauma and they go to report, there is almost another trauma that happens as people are not believed, they're forced to wait in right, um, police stations or hospitals um, without being cared for, without their physical needs being attended to, without their kind of their psychological trauma being something that's understood or compassionately responded to. So I think that it's really important that the first point of contact is a positive trauma informed, supportive one where people are believed. Like, I think I remember in, it would have been the early two thousands when I saw the stat and I, I don't actually know how accurate it is today. So it's outdated information, but the data said that people are more likely to fake their own death than to inaccurately or falsely report a a form of sexual assault. And that was a, a stat that came out of the FBI. So again, I don't know what the current evidence is about that, but if we are to say that weak people could go to whomever, whomever they're reporting to, whether it's the police or at the hospital, where there are often specially trained nurses to help get evidence and complete evidence kits, if people are believed and if people are treated in such a way that they are just automatically believed, Right. I think that this would change the number of people that report. I think that mm-hmm. this would change the experience then of feeling like people could be empowered in the reporting instead of further traumatized. I mean, those first conversations that people have after something awful has happened are they can make or break it for some people yeah. in terms of their mental health, their even their desire to live or survive. Yeah. Well, so often it gets mishandled from that first step. You know, mm-hmm. how many times you hear stories of someone going to a police station and saying, well, why didn't you fight them off? Or why didn't you try to run? Or why didn't you fill in the blank, putting them mm-hmm. in a defensive mode, you know? And it is like, we talk about trust, but verify all the time. And it's like, that doesn't happen. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like you have to earn our trust and then we'll trust you. And then we're still going to verify and put you through the ringer for you know, days and months and weeks and years. And I think that that's a really good approach to it. It's just showing that belief right out of the gate, like we would with anything else. Like if you go to the doctor and say something hurts, or if you go and, you know, unless you have a horrible doctor, it's typically like, they don't question you on that. You know, like they're going in to check it out and see if there's something legitimate there, something of substance there. Uh Um, I want to ask this 
as well because you, you mentioned like removing agency um you know like uh, trauma removes agency people you know we shouldn't make decisions for them we don't need to tell people oh you need some fresh air you need to go to a party or you need to come like telling them what to do is not always helpful but when there's that lack of agency how much push should you give someone or how much should you help them try to find that you know that agency because Again, some people will, you know, again, they'll sit and they won't go outside or they won't be with people and they need to take that step. It would be healthy for them. Um, You know, how do you help someone do that without being pushy or aggressive Mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. Again, my my disposition is to think about it from the angle of a therapist, um, Mm. which is different, right? I'm seen as an expert. People are usually coming to me for for help because they're already motivated. So I might do it a little differently than a friend does it. But I think about how important it is for us to have the hard conversations, not in the moment that is the hardest, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So actually, when things are going well, that's a really good time to have a hard conversation. Like, hey, I'm concerned about you. I want to help you. I can see you're struggling. Can we make a plan together? So picking the right moment instead of coming in, having a plan hatched, it's really our own agenda. And then just kind of like trying to drag someone out the door or take them into a weird intervention or something. Yeah. Right. In fact, we know that interventions are are extraordinarily unhelpful and often damaging and further isolate people from their community groups. So our ability to in moments of connection, then here's kind of, that's the first thing. The second thing is talk about it from a a perspective of what's happening for us. I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm scared. I know that this has been hard for you. I believe you. I want to help you. And then I think co-creating a strategy moving forward is really important too. So what would it look like for us to help you get help? Or can do you have any ideas about um, maybe things that I can help you with moving forward to get the support that you need? But instead of deciding for someone, telling them and coming in and kind of executing a plan, really slowing things down and thinking about how often what's really therapeutic for people is, is connection, right? the experiences of connection that allow us to be open to, to imagine that there's an, another reality besides mm-hmm. the traumatic one that we've been living in. I love the story um, Parker Palmer talks about, about being in depression and someone just sitting with him for years, rubbing his feet, right? That this was something, maybe not years, maybe it was months, but an extended period of time of not asking anything of him. And I think that so often we get scared when other people are stuck and it moves us into this kind of hyperdrive where we want to nudge people out of their distress because it is overwhelming for us. So really being able to slow things down and practice patience and presence and just show up for somebody consistently is probably going to do way more good than I have a plan that I've decided on my own about how you're going to get better. Right. Right. Cause it is more for us. Like we're doing it mm-hmm. so we can be comfortable again with the friendship or the relationship. Uh-huh. You know, if we want to see them do better so we don't have to be worried about it, you know? Yeah. And, um, I, I, you've hit on this with almost every other question, you know, like you've kind of hinted the fact, like there are therapists who are professionals at helping people through this. And that's something I talk about ad nauseum on the show. Um, I've, brought on trauma therapists in the past who've talked about this and it's really important um, for people to get that, especially coming from religious circles where sometimes the pastor can replace that role of a therapist and they're not qualified to do so. Or, uh, you know, other people who consider themselves to be discipling someone through something it, it becomes, because it is a medical thing, it's very dangerous to try to handle that on your own. So I want to just get, from you kind of the process for someone who has gone through a trauma, they want to uh, get started with therapy. They want to go to someone who is a professional. Where should they start? How should they start looking? Um, You know, what should people do if they're ready to start kind of taking those steps? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to look for a therapist who's licensed. Um, There is a difference between right? People who have credentials and people who claim to do trauma work. It's really important that you work with somebody who has a regulatory body, because what that means is if you are treated in such a way that, um, yeah, someone is doing something unethical, you can report them and you can ask for accountability for those people. So going to someone who is credentialed, licensed, has training in doing trauma work, and maybe even depending on what it is, 
training in the specific kind of trauma that you have, right? It's different to treat a single incident trauma than it is to treat a uh, developmental trauma that happened for years growing up. It, those kind of things, those different ways that trauma shows up need different kinds of medicines, so to speak. Is there a certain type of credential people should look for? Because this is something too, like mm -hmm. some people will say, oh, I'm a certified this, or I right. am, you know, um, I mean, there's people that are nothetic counseling, you know, and they've got some kind of weird mm -hmm. label and thing. Is there a specific thing people should be looking for when they're looking for a certain type of license or certification? Um, my guess is that there would be, it's different in the States than it is in Canada. So I can speak really well to the Canadian landscape, but I know that you're in the U S and so there's, um, we've got a couple Canadian listeners, so yeah. it'll, it's okay. <laughs> As a, I mean, one thing that's helpful to know is that registered psychologists have to have a PhD, okay. um, have to pass extensive board exams, um, are responsible for ongoing supervision, for being supervised. So you can't necessarily practice in isolation. So you need to get ongoing continuing education and whatnot. You're considered um, a healthcare provider. So uh, the same regulatory uh, requirements for other healthcare providers apply to psychologists. So that's kind of like, um, there tends to be a little bit less gray area and a little bit more rigor in terms of training and certification, but there are loads of different tiers and kinds of counselors who are certified. Um, counselor is not a protected term. So anybody can just dis describe themselves as a counselor without necessarily that meaning that they have uh, ongoing training or received supervision or um, clinical hours working hands-on under the supervision of somebody to get no. let's say, like really, really good clinical training. So look at, if you're looking at somebody or you have a friend who saw a therapist or you see someone online um, really making sure that their credentials check out. And another way to go into it is actually to try to look at the kinds of therapy. So looking at people who do sensory motor psychotherapy, um, AEDP, EMDR, uh, right. Um, I'm trying to think about all, all sorts of different ones. There's Focusing, so many. Yeah, there's, yeah. Um, there's equine therapy. There's exactly. like so many different types. Yeah. Yeah, so looking at some of the body-based therapies as well, because our bodies are so much better at storing trauma than necessarily our kind of our intellect or our minds are. And so often we can get to trauma through our body than in ways that we couldn't even really through the stories that we're telling. So looking up the kinds of therapy as well, or the kinds of therapists, those are different different ways to go. And then I think what's really important when we're working with someone to do trauma work is that we go slow. So we actually speed up by slowing down in trauma work because most of the ways that we protect ourselves are to get away from the trauma or to get stuck in it in ways that we don't even realize that we're looping in it and having ourselves attuned to someone and to be attuned to in a way that drops us into a really aware place is going to be the place that allows us to start making changes and healing. So we can want to move really fast because we're in distress, or we can want to be a cowboy. Like sometimes therapists move way too fast because they want to feel powerful or they don't, maybe don't have the patience or the stamina to slow down, but moving at the right pace is so important. So even if they have the right credentials, if they are, uh, you know, trained in one of the things that I just mentioned, but when you're with them, it just feels way too fast, way too much or not enough, right? Tell them that or find someone else. Yeah. Yeah. That's something um, I've had Claire Horner on the show. Who's a religious trauma therapist. And she talks mm -hmm. about that. Like you have to have a good relationship and, and you also don't have to commit to the first person that you see, you know, like she's she, and, exactly, um, you know, she always talks about like asking questions and, you know, she always says the first question I ask is, are you seeing a therapist? <laughs> you yes. know, like, yeah. um, so that's kind of her first question, but yeah, that's, I think that's really helpful for people to, to understand. And, just one last question about that. Um, you know, you talk about taking it slow. I think for some people, there's a hesitancy because, you know, it's so much unknown, obviously, what to expect. Um, but also, is this something that is a rest of your life thing? Is it something that mm -hmm. is a short few months? Is it something I know it's obviously different for everybody. Um, but is this something where, you know, uh, there's a set end goal in mind a lot of times mm -hmm. when you're when you're seeing a therapist? And you mean a, a time related end goal as right. opposed to like a, a symptom related well, end yeah, goal? Yeah, I would, I would, it would probably be symptom related, I would assume, but I'm, I, but I'm 
just wondering for people, because I think some people are hesitant because they're like, okay, if I start doing this, there's no end in sight. Right, I'm going right. to be paying, you know, because I've heard people say that. And I've said that, you know, I'm going to be mm-hmm. paying someone every month. They don't want to cure me because I'm going to be there every month. And, you know, I'm a patient. Um, but, you know, I know that's not the case. I know that there is obviously progress marks and things like that. Yeah. Um, so what? how should people, I guess, anchor their expectations is probably the best way to, to ask that. Yeah. I mean, it really depends on the kind of trauma and where we're, what we're getting treatment for. And also what's happening in the present, because there have been some people I've seen who have a pretty like clean cut trauma. You know, they had a single thing that happened in a very uh, discreet period of time and place that they don't encounter very often. It was a one-time thing. It was very traumatic and contained and they got great support after, but then right. As we're doing the trauma processing, some other crisis unfolds. And because they're kind of destabilized a little bit from the processing, then it feels like, wow, everything else is harder to manage. So it really depends on the person, like what the trauma was, what your resources are, what's happening in the present, um, what the nature of the therapy is, because there are some kind of therapies that move, move things very, very quickly. We call them power therapies. And then some kinds of therapies that are slower, um, but less effective but maybe help titrate the intensity and allow us to move, move through things in the way that, right, that we need. It's, there are so many different factors that we're talking about here, because what I recognize what I'm saying is we need to really slow down, but there are some therapies that are just not really good for processing trauma. And those are often the cognitive based therapies because they don't really get to how our body is storing it. And they keep us up in our defenses Like if we have left the intensity of the sensation and the emotion and the memory by going up to into storytelling, and then someone invites us to storytell about our trauma, but we're not having a new experience and our body isn't learning from the bottom up that we're safe. You get to sep. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you get to separate a little bit from the trauma by just Uh talking about it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and so sometimes like those feel slow, but they're they can be an ineffective kind of slow where we could do an experiential slow that moves things very quickly, but feels really hard to be with because it's actually pushing, kind of pushing on the bruises, so to speak. So I would say uh, it really depends on where you're at, but I love to let people know when I'm working with them, my goal is to work myself out of a job. I really think that it's important that we distribute care into our communities. And so there are times when I'll say, how would you feel about taking a break to see if, if you can access the things that we've talked about on your own or with your friends or whatever. And for other people, the relationship with the therapist is the one secure attachment figure that they have in their life. There have been wounds on wounds on wounds of abandonment and knowing that they can go to someone tell death for the rest of their life to be seen and attuned to is the medicine that they need. And so I think it it really depends on who you are, where you are, what you need, what season of your life you're in, what the trauma was, how the therapist works, what the relationship is. And ultimately what we want is for our, we want to know because of therapy, we are safe when we are safe. We're in danger when we are in danger, Hmm. knowing how to get out of those dangerous situations and how to bring ourselves back to safety to be able to trust ourselves, to trust other people and to believe in our own fundamental goodness. And I think all of those things, um, if we are noticing that we are moving towards those things or have the ability to help ourselves kind of hang in there with them, even if things are rocky, that tells us that, yeah, maybe, maybe we're doing a great job on our own. That's awesome. Uh, it's, it's, this has all been extremely helpful and, um, I don't say it lightly and I can't believe it just hit two thirty. <laughs> this time just flew by. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this and, um, definitely for everybody who's listening, be sure to grab a copy of the wisdom of your body. It's so helpful. It goes so much deeper than we can do in just an hour, but I wanted to get you in front of my audience to really talk through this because it's something that's happening in conversation. People are asking me, I don't have the answers and I think it's it's good to be able to bring someone on like yourself to to really address this. So thank you so much. It's been an honor and such a joy. It, you had just such beautiful and important questions and um I'm so glad that you are making a space for people to talk about these things so that they actually get yeah, get healing, get get connection, get community in the midst of all things that have been hard. That's awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs>